I look like a fucking pumpkin. That's fine. Happy fall, y'all. I decided to move you guys over a little bit so we're not looking directly into my kitchen because I wanted you to see my fall decor. But then I realized that my fat head covers the bulk of it. So I moved this more this way because this thing was pushed like closer to my couch. So now it's just literally in the middle of my living room and I'm gonna have to put it back after the video. I know I uploaded a video that was pretty much this like two days ago or like okay it's like four days but this series has got me really intrigued on all the crazies in the world and so I just all I wanted to do is sit on let's not meet and read these fucking stories on my last video the uber stories you guys gave me so many different categories to look up and my brain is just like going immediately to those I just I want to read them so we're going to I'm gonna read more let's not meet stories I decided that today's theme was going to be crazy ex stories and while I was searching for crazy exes I found a lot Lot of like parents crazy exes like your mom's ex your dad's ex and so I wanted to look into those ones as well I'm way too invested in these I just I need to know what goes on in everyone's lives and I think that's my problem right now I don't think I get out of the house enough I really don't think so. I also wanted to say really quickly, I'm gonna force Brittany to make a story time because she has one of the scariest Uber stories I think that I've ever heard. Maybe it's scarier because she's my friend, but she went to North Dakota a couple weeks ago and she had, oh, the creepiest fucking encounter with an Uber driver. Like he literally tried to kidnap her and I want her to make a story time about it, but she won't because it's a really short story. And I'm like, dude, you just, you need to tell people about this. So I'm gonna force her to do that. She was like, did you tell my story? I'm like, no, because you need to, you need to tell your own story but anyways let's get into them it's really hot this this was a bad idea this whole thing that's a bad idea I just realized that the lighting is really weird right here like the sun's coming in over here do you care and you get to see the fall stuff also I wanted to say really quickly sorry this is gonna be a rambly beginning because I feel like I haven't had a nice ramble in a while I was saying in my depression video how I was gonna decorate my house for Christmas obviously because I'm a little too festive here. Do you guys want a video of me doing that? Maybe not necessarily me decorating, but I guess like a vlog. I don't know. I, I, I don't really know what I would do for it. I feel like a lot of people ask me where I get a lot of this stuff, like all the time. And I love decorating for holidays. I like decorating just in general. So if you guys want a video of me doing that, I can figure out how to do it exactly later. But if you want a video of me decorating my apartment for Christmas, let me know. It's spooky season. Shut the fuck up about Christmas. So the first story that I found says, my ex felt it was God's will that he saved me. And I, she has a TLDR at the end of this and I read it and it just, I have to read the whole thing. This one's very, very long. So we'll see how many more I get to. I have like four picked out right now, but they're all fucking long as shit. This is probably just gonna be a long video. I'd like to share a story of a once good friend turned horrible ex with you all. We met back in high school by chance. I was sitting in the library one early morning, doodling a little in a notebook when Tim came up to me. We shared a lot of common interests and I was deeply impressed by his drawing skills as he sketched a few draws for me. For the first few years, things were fine. We were great friends and got to know each other very well. He was the oldest of three children and the only boy in his family that was fairly religious. Not the say grace and Hail Mary religious, but definitely the say grace over the meal for five minutes in church every Sunday religious. I'm not really religious myself, but I wouldn't say I'm an atheist. I believe there's something greater than all of us, but I don't believe whatever it is demands we only talk to him in churches or over our food. Now Tim was a nice guy, and I did develop a crush on him, but I always thought whenever I made a move he would back off and avoid it, so I never assumed it would ever evolve into more. Things however changed at the end of my junior year. At this time, my family's visa in the US had misfiled and we were told we had two options. Leave the US for a year and reapply or fight it and risk being deported for five. At the same time, my dad had been fired from his job for some BS reason and my maternal grandmother was not doing well. This in turn affected my mom very badly because it was her last living parent and she hadn't had the chance to help her father during his last few years. At the same time, I was entering my senior year, three credits short of graduating early, and my sister was in her second year of college. There was also the fact that the USA was pretty much the only home I've ever known, so it was a question of when and not if. So my dad does the only thing he can think of. He asks some coworkers and family friends if they would take my sister and me in for a year so I could finish high school at the least. The family I ended up living with for that year was absolutely wonderful. They had only a son who we were friends with and they treated me like family from day one. The mom was Catholic, but she was one of the really great ones that wouldn't preach her faith into others or judge you by it. They had sort of adopted a lot of their son's friends who didn't have a nice home. And when one came out as gay, she smiled and said to him, God doesn't make mistakes. You're exactly as you're supposed to be. That's so fucking sweet. I started to call them mom and 
dad version 2.0 really fast because I felt they deserved those titles too for everything they helped me with. They took me into their home and let me live with them absolutely free. All they asked was that I studied hard in school, did a few chores when they asked, and respected their no alcohol, no sex rules. It's easy. It was here though that Tim started to show a side that none of us liked. At first it was just minor stuff. He would call almost daily to ask what I was doing and to hang out, and if I said I couldn't because of something, studying, wanting to spend time with our friends, etc., he would call my other parents to check and see if it was true. I wasn't new to relationships, but because I was technically an illegal immigrant in the States at the time, I had so many things on my plate, I didn't notice the signs. Things got even more stressful as my other father got prostate cancer and needed help getting to and from the hospital. I had to prioritize school and my other family rather than a boyfriend or friends. For whatever reason, Tim didn't like that. He started demanding I spend more time with him, that whenever I was free to go over to his house and spend the day. I liked his family, they were nice people, but I'm also an introvert, and if I don't have at least a little bit of solo time, I can't recharge properly. Soon the pressuring started, not for sex, but to go to church, his church. He kept saying how it was important and I would feel great going there and I would love it and it was a Christian duty. I've never found comfort in religion, much less the kind where they pressure on Christian duties. I avoided it for a while until I finally got the courage to tell him I wasn't comfortable with the idea of going to church. And given everything, I needed to focus on graduating as well as my family's own problems. I didn't feel I had time to add church to that. You would think it was okay, but not for Tim. He got super offended and started demanding that I give a better reason as to why not. He even went as far to go to my own mother and talk to her about the idea of us going to church. She thankfully told him that that was my choice, regardless of his feelings, and he needed to respect that. But then the creep factor went up a notch. He started showing up uninvited both at my home and school. He had graduated at the time he was in college. It was easy for him to get into school grounds since he had gone there too. He would go looking for me all over campus, trying to guess which classes I was taking to find me. Both my other parents and even my brother caught him peeking through my blinds to see if I was home after asking if I was really there or not. My other mother told him that was inappropriate, while my other father told him to never do that again because it was unacceptable. My brother at first made a few jokes about it, calling him Ogles? Uh, Ogles? For trying to peep in, but after he caught Tim doing it again at 2 in the morning while I was asleep, he told him he was officially going into Creeper's territory and he was gonna kick his ass if he didn't stop. Oh, and the light is, okay, well it's gonna probably just like shift across the whole thing as, uh, at, the sun's not going down, what's happening? I stopped laughing whenever Tim was around. I became more and more reserved to the point where everyone but Tim commented that I didn't seem happy in the relationship at all. And it was weird too because the farthest we had ever got doing anything was holding hands. He wouldn't even let me kiss him on the cheek in private. The final straw came when I was over at his place, trying to figure out how to tell him I wanted to go back to being friends, when his mom suddenly said that it was so nice that we were following tradition. I asked her what she meant and she told me that her and her husband had been high school sweethearts and married right after high school and that Tim was doing the same bitch you're in for a marriage. I full on panicked. We hadn't dated long. We barely did anything that could even consider us a couple. And I was heading back to Denmark after I graduated. I was only 18 and nowhere near the age where I felt ready to marry. Not to mention with how conflicted I was feeling about the relationship. I couldn't see this ever working out. I was starting to see that our relationship as a couple was more toxic rather than healthy. The first chance I had, I told him in private that I didn't feel like this was working out. I still wanted to be kind and not embarrass him in front of his family. I've never felt breakups should be public displays. Tim did not take this well. He pleaded and begged saying if I tried to go to church with him that I would see the light. Not sure how, since I didn't want to. That I was ruining his family traditions. He tried to argue that if we married, I could stay in the States. Uh, but I didn't want to marry for a green card. In the end, we both parted in tears and with things unresolved. A few weeks pass in silence as I focus on school and just recharging. I'm getting ready to graduate and dealing with the reality that my biological parents won't get to see it because our finances weren't very good at the time and try to focus that my other family and sister will at least get to see me get my diploma. Then, joy upon joy, as my mom wrote to me saying that she's going to visit for a week to see my graduation. I wanted both of them there, but I was so thankful that at least one of them would be there. I happily told my friends about it and we all started talking about who we would give our graduation tickets to. I can't remember how many we had, but I remember I had a few left after inviting my mom, other parents, and two brothers, and one of my friends asked if Tim was coming. I wasn't sure if I wanted him there after what had happened, but at the same time, I had gone to his back when we were friends. And like an idiot, I reached out and asked him if he wanted to come as a friend. I think I might move. How about we, like, shift this way a little bit? That's not Okay, but now this one's gonna come at me, and then it's gonna be even worse. So I just, like, we'll, we'll see what happens. Tim became a rate, ranting about how I was being a bitch and selfish. His anger was so explosive that it shocked me, and he finished it by saying this to me. There are five priorities in life, Lark. God, family, health, school, and friends in that order, but you don't seem to get that. Your order is family, friends, school, health, and then God. You need to sort yourself out. At the time, I was too shocked to react at first before I muttered a small, 
but that's how I see things. They are what matter. I gave my extra tickets to a classmate who needed them more. He had one of those massive close-knit families. Graduation comes and I receive my diploma with cheers and pride. Knowing that a high school diploma doesn't mean a whole lot, it's still my first set of proof that I can dedicate the time needed to learn something. I toss my cap, look forward after, and then I go look for my family. When I find them, I can instantly tell that something's off. They smile at me, but clearly something is bothering them. I ask what was wrong, but they try to brush it off, making an excuse that somebody had one of those stupid annoying horns with them. I didn't believe them, and in the end my mom told me that Tim had shown up. He said he needed to talk to her about me and how I needed to be saved. That I was going to hell because I wasn't embracing the church or what my womanly duties were meant to be. Womanly duties. She asked him what he meant and he said to obey her future husband. This man is fucking insane. She lost it. I did too when she told me. We were not engaged. And even if we were, I'm not some dog that's meant to follow orders. So to hear that Tim thought that I was his to order around made me furious. The last time I spoke with him, I let him have it. I yelled and threatened, telling him if he ever thought that he had any rights to decide what I deem important in my life, he had another thing coming. He tried to argue that I needed to be saved or I would go to hell, and I finally just screamed, I don't need to be saved. I don't want to be saved. I'm happy as I am. He stared at me, saying I didn't mean it. I said I did. And then if he kept pushing like he was, I never wanted to speak to him again. I told him it was making our friendship unbearable, and if he didn't learn to respect people's opinions on religion, the next relationship he would be in wouldn't work either. He got angry and said I was going to hell, and in a fit of rage I told him, our relationship is hell, you made it that way, to which he left immediately. I lived in the States for a month after that, and we didn't talk about it. His family tried to plead for me to apologize to Tim for what I had said, but I told them that I meant it because of his constant bullying. Why the fuck do you owe him an apology at all? After that I wasn't welcomed at their house anymore. Not that I ever wanted to go back. Tim tried to reach out to me a few years later with some sort of over-religious story and how I was like the main character. I told him I would like it if we could be friends, but if he was gonna send me religious texts like before, he needed to delete my contact info. We haven't spoken since. He ended up dating a dear friend of mine a few years later, only to mess it up the way he did ours. My friend asked if I was okay with them dating, to which I told her honestly that wasn't for me to decide. Just because he was my ex didn't give me any right to say who he could or couldn't date, but reminded her not to let him bully her about religion. She had just left the Mormon church. To this day, I still think he's single, trying to find some girl who he can save with religion. And while I wish for him to find a special someone someday that meets his needs, I will say this. Tim, I'm glad that we'll never meet again, as an ocean is now between us. TLDR, ex-boyfriend tries to pressure me to go to church to save me and follow his family tradition of marriage after high school. Then he becomes a total possessive stalker until I can't take it anymore and move to a different country. Holy fuck. I will say this, because I haven't had any relationships. I've never like actually dated someone who turned out to be crazy. I've had weird encounters with guys and I've had guys who have wanted to like pursue something that I'm not interested in and they're fucking creepy but I've never actually dated someone and then they were crazy and I talked like I saw I liked had a crush on a couple Mormon boys when I was in high school I don't know that was like my thing and none of them were crazy like this. I have something in my eye. Like, I don't think any of them were like, you have to be Mormon and we're gonna get married. That was a long story. Let's move on. This one says, I was kidnapped by my ex and I think he was going to kill me. This is another really fucking long one. They're all really long, but I feel like that's kind of expected. I don't think you could summarize a crazy ex story into nothing. Just like a prolonged relationship. You know, I think we need to move. I think the sun is about to like consume my entire body. Okay, much better. Back to normal. I previously posted this with a ton of detail about how I ended up with Oscar, but it was way too long and no one read it. I'm gonna try again with just the events surrounding the kidnapping, but just know that this is a sick and twisted man that I'd met online when I was 18 and ended up dating. He was jealous, controlling, vindictive, abusive in every possible way, and was filled with sadistic tendencies and rage. Good start. Fucking awesome start. So, I had tried to leave Oscar many, many times. I wasn't happy. In fact, I was in a constant state of panic and was absolutely miserable in the relationship that had just lasted a year. Each attempt to leave him was met with threats to hurt me and my family physically, dragging me back, sexually assaulting, and purposely trying to impregnate me, threatening to commit suicide or constant stalking and harassment until I surrender. This one's already much deeper than the last one. The last one was like crazy, but this one's just fucking scary. And I'm like two paragraphs in. Finally, I had enough and decided I wasn't gonna go back no matter what he did. He called my job nonstop and got me in major trouble and did the same at my house, prompting me to unplug the phone line. He texted me to say he promised he was going to kill himself if I didn't go back to him. Instead of caving in, I called his mom at work and told her. She got a hold of him and said I must have misunderstood because he was clearly fine. I felt I'd done all I could and told him I would call the police the next time he said something like that to have him go check on him. The next day I got a call on myself from Oscar. I rejected it. He called again and I rejected it again. Then I heard the loud exhaust of his car outside. Oh, 
fuck? Well, I looked out on my phone and saw him calling again. I let it go to voicemail while I peeked through the blinds to check and see if I truly heard his car, as I'd started to falsely hear it sometimes out of paranoia. But this time, he was indeed out in front of my house. My phone started ringing again, and wanting him to stop, I answered it. He told me to come outside. I don't want to see you, I said. Just come outside for a few minutes, please, Oscar said, making a huge effort to sound pleasant. I told you to stop calling and you just show up at my house, why can't you respect my wishes? I asked, knowing the question would not be addressed. I just felt bad about how everything went down and wanted to give you something I made for you before you broke up with me. Just come out for a few minutes so I can apologize, then I'll go away and you'll never have to hear from me again, Oscar pleaded. I don't know, I don't trust you, I told him, looking at him sitting in his car through the living room window. I promise, he said, kind of convincingly. I drove all the way here just to give you what I made and have a proper goodbye. In hindsight, I should have called BS on all of that immediately, but I was young and still way too controlled by my need to not hurt other people's feelings. I felt bad that he had driven 40 minutes to my house with something he had made for me, for me to just refuse to go outside. Fine, only for a few minutes, and you promise you're not going to try and beg for me back. He promised and I went outside. I opened the passenger side door and sat down in the seat, leaving the door wide open. He commented that I must think he's going to kidnap me, trying to pass it off like a joke. I told him I just wanted the lake room. He had a book of flowers and some cases of DVDs he had burned for me of all of the seasons of my favorite TV show. We talked for a minute when my cell phone rang. I shouldn't have picked it up, knowing it was a guy from my job, but I was an idiot. I answered it and talked to the guy for less than 30 seconds. Oscar could hear it was a man's voice. I could instantly tell when I saw his head snap to attention in my peripheral vision. When I hung up, Oscar looked at me with fury in his eyes and asked some question about the caller that I can't even recall now. Before I could reply to whatever he asked, he had slammed on the accelerator and was flying down the street with my door still open. I instinctively pulled my legs into the vehicle and started screaming for him to stop. He didn't seem to even be hearing me. I tried to jump out when he slowed down at intersections and seeing this, he grabbed my clothes with his hands to hold me in and started making sharp left turns throughout the neighborhood to force my my door shut. Once that was accomplished, I tried to open the door again and he kept hitting the automatic locks to stop me. He was consistently increasing his speed to ensure that any leak from the car would be dangerous. By now it was dark outside. He was speeding through my town, double the speed limit. I was hoping a police officer would see this and start trailing him and pull him over, but apparently he had gone unseen. He reached the freeway and I really started panicking. He'd be able to go even faster here and fast track me wherever he planned to take me. It took maybe three minutes to get on the freeway at the speed he was going, all of which I spent trying to get out of the vehicle. Once he was on the freeway, he was going over 100 miles per hour. I kept looking at the speedometer. It was dark outside, and I was much too fast to jump from a moving car on the freeway, with other cars driving at high speeds unable to see me. I still had my phone, so I tried to dial 911. I pressed the numbers with my hand shoved down the side of my seat by my window, away from Oscar. He saw what I was doing and started swerving all over the road while trying to grab my phone. This is just fucking terrifying because for starters, I just already like have a fear of car accidents because I got to a really bad accident a couple years ago. And so just being in cars makes me fucking anxious and then try thinking of like, oh my god, like a lunatic who's like threatened me a million times driving 100 miles per hour, like not caring what happens to either of us. Fucking Fuck, dude. I still don't really know how he managed to get it away from me, because every ounce of my being was holding on. He took it, rolled down his window, and threw it out. Rolling his window back up, he flatly stated, If I can't have you, then no one will. That sentence made my heart sink. I felt like I was in a Lifetime movie. Oscar was possessed by his need to possess me, and I was trapped. This is when the grim reality started to really set in. He was out of control and out of options. I started screaming for help and pounding on the windows, but Oscar had the tint on those windows so dark that I probably wouldn't have been seen even if it wasn't dark outside. I watched as the people in each car we passed remained blissfully unaware of the chaos going on in the car I was being kidnapped in. I was feeling very defeated, but was running through all the possibilities of how this could go over and over in my mind, trying to figure out how to survive. I decided to stop fighting and acting afraid because the only way I saw myself making it out of this alive was by feeding into Oscar's delusional state. I had no other weapons or means of escape at my disposal, so I decided on psychological warfare. Oscar had this friend named Jose that he had gotten exceedingly close with over the course of our relationship. After some time, it was revealed to me in confidence that Jose had fled from Puerto Rico, supposedly on the run for murder. Okay, fuck this! I already thought this was bad, but that is like really fucking escalated. I saw Oscar was taking the necessary freeway interchanges to get to Jose's place. I knew that even if his friend hadn't really been wanted for murder, he was the type of guy who'd do anything for Oscar without moral restriction. Jose and I got along okay, but I knew he'd have no loyalty to me whatsoever. He was nice to me as long as I was an extension of Oscar. 
I had to act quickly. I proceeded to tell Oscar that I loved him and wished we could be together, but that I didn't see how it could ever work when things like what he was doing right now proved that he never cared about what I wanted. I hadn't really cited that as a reason for wanting out of the relationship before, as it was much more complex than that, but I was hoping that it was enough to offer him hope in a state of desperation. I told him I'd been considering giving him another chance when I saw the flowers and DVDs, but now that he was refusing to take me home when I asked him to, I was starting to second guess things. Oscar got off the freeway at Jose's exit, and I started trying to formulate a plan for when the car stopped. I knew Jose had neighbors close by, and I decided I was going to run as fast as I could and scream at the top of my lungs. I was trying to keep Oscar's mind preoccupied in the meantime, though, so he wouldn't think to call Jose and give him a heads up. They usually spoke to each other in Spanish, so I would have no idea what was even said. Oscar told me that he did care about what I wanted, and asked if he still had a chance with me if he turned around right now. In an effort to not expose myself with an overly enthusiastic reply, I hesitated a bit, and said I thought we could probably work it out, and this would be a good place to start. Oscar looped around and got back on the freeway, headed in the opposite direction, back towards my house. The rest of the ride was tense because Oscar was normally so perceptive I didn't want to reveal myself and end up back in the line of fire. I can't recall what was said on the commute back, but I opted to talk about regular everyday things I would normally say to him in casual conversations. When we got back to my house, he let me open my door and didn't stop me from leaving. I could finally breathe. I got out, taking the flowers and DVDs with me, and waved to him before walking into my house. I walked straight to the garbage bin and threw it all in the trash and then collapsed on my couch, shaking violently but ultimately so grateful to have made it home. The next day I went to the police station and filed a restraining order against him. Within a few years he would be jailed for other appalling crimes and sentenced to 60 years. Until I found that out, I never truly felt safe. He's definitely where he belongs. So psychopath I dated that kidnapped me and was likely going to murder me. Let's not meet again. Okay, um, what the fuck? Like I literally don't know what to say because I... I can't comprehend what just happened. I'm so fucking glad you're okay. And I hope that you're doing okay now because that shit is scarring. Oh my God. I can't imagine all I know. Mm -mm. See ya. Oh my God. Like the first two stories are so very different. I wasn't expecting that. I'm gonna read one more just because I normally read three in these videos, but I don't want to. This one says, in quotes, that's where your body will be within half an hour. I can't wait. I can't wait. I really, I just can't wait. I was raised in a fairly strict but loving Christian household in the Bible Belt. My parents weren't unreasonable about their rules and were well-intentioned, but I broke a few along the way like most teenagers do. The summer before I started college, I began a relationship with a slightly older guy. I knew him from high school and he was attending the college that I would soon be at. Johnny was a catch. He was exceptionally handsome, had been on the football team, and was on a full academic scholarship. Funny, talented, and very personable. There was little to not like about him. The best part, he had his own apartment at the college, which was a four hour drive from my parents' house. I could easily sneak up there under the guise of visiting one of my other friends or spending the night at a local friend's house. My parents didn't even have to know I had a boyfriend. Now I had just turned 18 and was enjoying my rebellious streak and newfound freedom, but I still happily lived under my parents' guidance and rules for a large part. They always encouraged me to be a free thinker and to ultimately figure out my own morals and values, and I ended up much like them. My mom wisely encouraged me not to just sleep with anyone, and it was something I actually held to quite strongly. So while I had no problem having sleepovers with my boyfriend, I was intent on not having sex with him. He took it pretty well and seemed to respect my decision. One week, smack dab in the middle of summer, I had three days off in a row at work. A drive up to see Johnny was in order and I began to travel early in the morning. He was excited to see me and we had a great day. I nerfed gun wars, reading Stephen King, making out. We went out for dinner and returned for a night of shenanigans, or so I thought. Upon entering his apartment, Johnny produced a box of condoms. He had tried this before, so I wasn't phased and adamantly told him it wasn't happening. The events that unfolded following this seemingly unimportant interaction still haunt me today. Okay, if there's like an, I'll put a trigger warning here if I read it and there's anything bad. If you don't see anything on the screen, then it's okay. Johnny's smile disappeared and his eyes went cold, hauntingly cold. I was sitting at his dining room table with my back against the wall. He was standing at the other end of the small table. You make me sick. I'm sick of you. You play me. All you do is play me. We were serial pranksters and sarcastic in every sense of the word. And while this made my skin crawl, I knew he was joking. I'd known Johnny for years after all. I thought about this for a long time and you're dead? I'm not doing this anymore. You make me so sick. I hate you when you're dead. You're oh my god if my boyfriend ever was like I'm, you're dead i'm gonna kill you i like it's not funny like at all like i feel like even if you're sarcastic and you joke around like that like that's not a funny fucking thing to say especially with like hatred in your eyes i don't want to read the rest but i'm going to he was unnervingly calm and his voice betrayed a slight hint of anger that i've never heard before i noticed him clenching his fist popped out veins tracing up his arms for the first time in our entire relationship i felt unsafe with him 
He held my gaze, unblinking. His second floor apartment was on campus. It was summer. I had seen nobody else in the building. No other cars were in the parking lot. Even if I could get past him, which I couldn't, my two options were unlocking the balcony door and jumping, or racing 15 feet down the hallway to the deadbolted front door, which opened inwardly, and getting down a flight of stairs. Either scenario led to an empty parking lot. I would have to get to my car or run to the woods nearby. While athletic, I had no chance against him physically. I focused on him. Half of me just knew he was kidding. He had to be. He would break into laughter any second now, and we would return to our beautiful day. He continued talking. I can't repeat what he said. It was too graphic and specific to our location to write out in a public forum. He detailed the sexual assault he had in store for me. If I survived, I would be strangled in the nearby woods and then carted off and dumped in a secluded spot that we had explored together. He motioned to some bag set on his counter. That's where your body will be within an hour. What the fuck? It, what, what the fuck happened? Like, what? I don't understand how he could go from being, like, I don't know, like, loving and so normal. Like, you have been seeing him for a while and you've stayed with him, whatever. Like, what happened, like, in, like, the two seconds that made him like this? Just, like, that you didn't want to have sex with him? Like, that just seems so crazy. Like, I don't understand what... What the fuck happened? I had enough. His plan was too well thought out to be impromptu. I'm small, but I'm stubborn, and I would fight to the death if I had to. I also have a wicked straight face when I need to. It was my turn to hold his gaze and all the ferocity I could muster. I stood up and said the first thing that came to my mind. I'm still proud of the unflinching calm I presented. Inside I was begging God to not let me die. You're real funny. I almost believed you for a second. Wouldn't have worked anyways because what I was going to tell you before all that happened is that my dad asked me to come home tonight. He needs help first thing in the morning with the garden for mom's birthday because Kyle, my brother, hurt his back and I told him I would call him as soon as I was on the road within half an hour. It was a lie, and not a particularly good one, but the delivery was convincing. I dangled my phone in his face and told him he could explain to my dad why I wasn't coming home tonight if he wanted me to stay. Johnny's mouth was open wide as he stared at me. I was just kidding, he mumbled, fist still clenched. See ya, I chirped, pushing past him. My gamble paid off. I grabbed my purse and shuffled down the hallway. I could feel his eyes burning through me and the electric energy in the room as I internally screamed at myself to move slowly. The deadbolt disengaged and I walked out and fought every urge to run down the stairs. I was too far from my car if he chased me to beat him, and I refused to give him the satisfaction of seeing me scared. I walked the entire length of the car park. I've always had a habit of parking as far out as possible, next to the woods that he told me he would murder me in. I knew he was watching me the entire time. I could feel his eyes follow my every movement. As I drove out, past his apartment, I saw his shadow in the balcony window. I waved. He stared. I drove a few miles to the nearest Walmart. It was only 8 and the sun was starting to set. People milled through the parking lot, blissfully unaware of what I had just gone through. I collapsed onto my steering wheel and broke down, bawling my eyes out, and then I drove the four hours back home. Stupidly, I didn't know how to process what happened and banished it to the recesses of my mind. I spent the next few years avoiding Johnny. A few times I thought about it, I blamed myself for being so naive. I finally told my mom four years after the fact and was able to process through it. So possible murderer ex-boyfriend who thankfully now lives 10,000 miles away from me, let's not meet again. Someone commented because like I was saying before, I don't understand what exactly changed. Like it seems like he just went zero to a hundred. And so someone commented, they were like, were there any other red flags? And they said none that they recognized at the time that there was a couple stuff about like hurting animals, some religious stuff. And then him getting into like Stephen King and horror, which I don't really know how that's assigned because I love horror, but like I would never threaten to kill someone. What the fuck? Hope you guys enjoyed. Cause what, I don't, I, I don't know what I just read. See the other stories are like crazy and they're scary and they're very short and summarized, but these are like long and traumatizing. Actually everything's traumatizing. What am I saying? I think these are just worse because obviously it's somebody that you trusted and somebody that you were in a relationship with and you thought that you knew and then they turn into this and they threaten to do these things to you and it just, it makes no fucking sense. I will have all the stories linked down below if you guys want them for any fucking reason. I'm gonna go call my boyfriend, make sure that he doesn't want to kill me, because that'd be nice to know. Get out of it now. If you guys have any other categories that you want me to look into on Let's Not Be, let me know. I love these videos. I don't know why. They're really intriguing to me, and I like looking for the stories, like reading all of these, I don't know. It's just, it's crazy to think that this shit really fucking happens. It's so crazy to me. But please stay safe. If you're in a relationship that is abusive or that you're scared of, you can get help. You can find people who will help you. I know it's hard and I know that it's scary, but I know that you guys can do it. Also, I wanted to say, because I saw this on Twitter and I don't, I don't know, I don't ever talk about this kind of stuff, but it was a guy who was basically saying that girls are fucking stupid because it was a girl who had tweeted that her boyfriend had hit her 
and then another tweet where they were back together. I don't think people understand how hard it is to get out of abusive relationships. I was never in like a physically abusive relationship, but I have been in like mentally abusive relationships. I feel like a lot of people have. And even that, it's so fucking hard to get out of it. You just want to believe that the person's going to change and you care about them so much that you want to help them and you want to be there for them. It's not as easy as just dropping someone and leaving. So stop trying to act like people are stupid or people are asking for it or whatever the fuck. Like, I, that tweet pissed me off. But anyways, I'm not going to go on a rant about that. I love you guys. Please stay safe. Again, I will see you in the next one. Bye. I really can't believe that I cut my bangs again. And honestly, horrible job this time. Did a horrible job. I look like coconut head. I was just bored. And this is what happens when I'm bored. Actually, they look okay when they're like done. But when I actually look at them, like look at the cut job. This one. I'll admit that I fucked up. The rest of it though, is fine. I don't need professionals. I can fuck up my own shit, and then I can fix my own shit. It's fine, it's just hair, it'll grow. So you know what, whatever, it's okay, fine, see ya.